Now we come to the statement by the Vice President of the Commission, High Representative of the Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, the U.S. Middle East Plan. In other words, an EU response in line with international law. Uh, now, uh, while the uh, Commission... Uh, the Commission representative, Mr. Borrell, in other words, as he passes over to the other side of the chamber, I simply wanted to remind you about the various procedures concerning blue cards. Oh, well, uh, the Commissioner has taken his place, and uh, he now has the floor for an opening statement. Thank you very much, Commissioner, please. Mr. President, honorable members, I am really grateful for having this opportunity to address you today on the Middle East peace process. This issue is of fundamental strategic importance to the European Union. For too long, we have been witnessing a conflict that has caused endless suffering for generations of Israelis and Palestinians alike. The increasingly dire situation on the ground, including violence, terrorism, incitement, settlement expansion, illegal, by the way, and the consequences of the ongoing occupation, has destroyed hope on both sides and reduced the viability of a two-state solution. At an international level for a number of years, there has been little or no substantive engagement in efforts to resolve the conflict. Indeed, as one observer pointed out to me recently, there is neither peace nor a process. In recent years, we, on the European Union side, are perhaps the only actor to have stayed the course. We have been vocal in our support for a negotiated two-state solution, based on the international agreed parameters and in accordance with international law. This means a two-state solution based on the parameters set in the Council conclusions, our Council, of July 2014, that meets Israeli and Palestinian security needs and Palestinian aspiration for statehood and sovereignty, ends the occupation that began in 1967, and resolve all permanent status issues in order to end the conflict. Our vision, our European vision, is a principal one and a pragmatic one. It reflects our broader attachment as Europeans to the rules-based international order. We are also active on the ground. No other international actor has been as engaged as we have been in practical efforts to build a future Palestinian state. In 2019 alone, the European Union and its member states had an open portfolio of some 600 million in assistance to the Palestinians. I said during my hearing, it means 600 million, it's almost 1.5 million euros a day. But where are we today? It remains my firm view, but there is still a way forward if both the parties are willing to resume credible and meaningful negotiations, international support for any such efforts would clearly be crucial to their success. In this regard, the tabling of concrete proposals, such as the United Nations one, could be helpful, both as a catalyst for deeper reflection on the way forward, as a potential opportunity to quick start a political process which has been at a standstill for too long. However, as I have said, the proposal tabled two weeks ago clearly challenges the international agreed parameters. And it is difficult to see how this initiative can bring both parties back to the table. 25 out of 27 member states of the Foreign Affairs Council supported this consideration. Two were against it. So it was not a unanimous decision of the Council, 
and I could not present it like this, but on the statement of the High Representative, which I am repeating here again. Last week, I was in Washington in a very busy day, talking with all foreign affairs, external policy, higher authorities of the U.S. government. I put this point to my interlocutors. We need to ask ourselves whether this plan provides a basis for a progress or not. We need to know whether the proposals themselves are really open for negotiations. It is the starting point or the end point. For the European Union's part, our position is clear. We are ready to work with the international community to revive a political process in line with international law, which ensures equal rights and which is acceptable for both parties. Thank you for your attention, and I am looking forward for an important discussion, which I am sure you will follow. Thank you very much, um, Commissioner Borrell Fonteles. Our uh, first speaker will be Asima Kopulu, Anna Michel. Mr. Borrell, you stated that the United States Middle East Peace Plan departs from internationally agreed parameters. Here I am. You also used rather pointed language originally when you said that part of this plan, if implemented, could not pass unchallenged. Naturally, this evoked a reaction from our Israeli friends who warned that this type of what they call threatening language could lead to the EU's role in the peace process being minimized. Meanwhile, the Palestinian leadership has angrily dismissed President Trump's plan as a conspiracy. I think it's frankly unreasonable to expect that either side would greet this proposal with any real enthusiasm. But I would like to choose to view the glass as half full and not half empty. So this plan could perhaps serve as a basis for resuming talks in earnest with the understanding that there are, in fact, painful concessions to be made on both sides. This is your moment to shine, Mr. Burrell. Europe could perhaps assume a much more prominent role, an active role, as an honest broker of just and lasting peace, and it could encourage both sides to consider the plan as a starting point for reopening meaningful goodwill negotiations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Asima Kopulu. Our next speaker is Madam Kati Piri. And colleagues, Honorable High Representative, we do not know what President Trump's deal of the century actually is, apart from being one-sided, illegal, and intentionally provocative. But it is most certainly not a genuine effort at finding a peaceful resolution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Let me be clear. Negotiations between Israel and Palestine were broken off in 2014 and must be resumed as soon as possible. But that is not what this plan will lead to. This plan disregards the international rules-based order. It not only normalizes illegal settlements, but also clears the way for the utterly illegitimate annexation of the Jordan Valley and 30% of the West Bank. And we must make clear that such actions will have serious consequences for our relationship with Israel if that happens. Inevitably, it will also lead to more suffering for the Palestinian people, whether that is because their land is annexed, their water resources are taken, or because they lack control over their own borders. This is a cynical plan of two far-right leaders seeking a cheap popularity boost ahead of elections. This is a slap in the face of Israelis and Palestinians who genuinely want to find a solution. I therefore call on you, Mr. High Representative, to continue supporting all efforts that truly involve both parties. The people of Israel and Palestine need a real peace plan, and if we as Europeans can play a constructive role in that, we should do so. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Piri. 
Madam Hilde Voutmans now for a minute and 30. Voorzitter. Thank you, President. My representative colleagues, last week once again we've been sucked into another Trump rabbit hole, a two-state solution for Israel and Palestine with all the advantages for Israel and a few crumbs for the Palestinians. Trump's plan was basically nothing than a one-state solution for Israel's benefit wrapped up as a two-state solution. A missed opportunity, you say? Well, Trump's proposal is uh, just compounding the already delicate uh, situation between Israel and the Palestinians. So now, if ever, there's a role for the European Union here. In recent years, America was far too one-sided in playing the Israeli card. The, the strategy for the Middle East lies in tatters. Europe still has its strategy, so let, let, we, we still have our credibility, and let's use that to intervene as an honest broker so that we can put together the pieces broken by Trump, as it were. Let's get the Israelis and Palestinians around the table again, or at least in, in direct negotiations, and let us make it clear that our red lines as Europeans are broadly backed by the international community. I believe, Mr. Borrell, that an, an international peace conference at the, at the high level, led by you, would be the, the way to, uh, out of this, and we would give you our backing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Waldmanns. The next speaker for a minute, uh, Boom Frisco, a minute and a half. Micro. Ecco. Grazie, Presidente. Well, thank you very much, President. Now, uh, President and High Representative, this is a discussion of particular uh, of a particular delicate nature. As, as European Union, we have to declare our particular position above all because Belgium, Estonia, Germany, as non-permanent members, are on the side of uh, France in the Security Council in the United Nations right now. With Brexit, uh, it, the time has come for us to exercise external policies which will, at the, which will be new and uh, provide horizons for the future. Uh, a new policy which will move from European security, deal with the major issues of migration, energy, climate change, the 5G, all the way up to uh, European investments in those particular countries. The uh, Lisbon of Treaty calls for peace throughout the world and that the policies ought to go in that direction. So I would like to invite you to take into consideration three factors. The existential uh, threat of Israel is against Israel is more palpable than ever. Um, it is it is the Hebrew nation. It is not the Hebrew nation which goes, which representatives, represents our deepest roots, Hebrew roots. So the high representative ought to take into consideration this and take this opportunity to show, indeed, the heights to which Europe can go to defend this particular heritage. Putikofa. Colleague Putikofa. President, colleagues, a great number of victims of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict have long been languishing for a peace plan. And such a peace plan must, of course, include painful concessions, but concessions from both sides. It must include security for Israel, but it must also include a viable sovereign, contiguous state for the Palestinians living side by side with the Israelis. This is not what Trump is presenting to us. It's not a fresh start. It's a dead end. The so-called peace plan is neither about peace because it doesn't overcome, it prolongs the conflict, nor is it a plan as a point of departure for negotiations. It's rather a dictate. When they talk about a peace plan, effectively they push for annexations. And a two-state solution is different from one state plus one canton. We cannot... Thank you very much, colleague Putikofa. Our next speaker is colleague Weimers. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. High Representative Borrell. 
You called on both sides to re-engage and uh, refrain from any unilateral actions that would exacerbate tensions. This is a peace plan widely accepted in Israel, but fully rejected on the Palestinian side. Fine. But Palestinians won't even sit down at the table. Many in the Palestinian population prefer violence. In fact, last month, Palestinian NGOs refused EU funding rules prohibiting our aid to be channeled to terrorist groups. In their refusal, these NGOs, 70% funded by the EU, are calling what they believe to be your bluff. High Representative, show them that the EU means business. Encourage long-term re-engagement and easing of tensions. Say a thousand times, no, 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 to EU funding Palestinian rejectionist and terrorist policies. Thank you. Thank you very much, colleague Weiner. For one minute, colleague Pineda. Thank you, President. The Trump Netanyahu tandem, with unprecedented cynicism, have presented what they called the deal of the century. But it's, it's not legitimate to talk about an agreement when one of the parties involved, the Palestinian people, hasn't even been consulted nor signed up to this pact, or any type of pact. This is an illegal parody which um, infringes on international law and any number of UN resolutions. So this agreement, which isn't legitimate or, or, or legal, can hardly be called the, the deal of the century. It's the fraud of the century, the swindle of the century, reflecting um, the, the shamelessness of two people who have had criminal proceedings taken out against them in their respective countries. Mr. Borrell's statement was, was wonderful. I'd like to uh, compliment him on it. But now I think, Mr. Borrell, the time has come to take action. We need your statement. But at a time such as this, the European Union must break off the association agreement with Israel and recognize Palestine. The speaker's mic has been cut off. Thank you very much. Did you Vice President, dear Commissioner, Dear colleagues, each and every force in this world is more than welcome if this force puts a proposal for a solution on the table, especially when it's a proposal for a solution with the objective of a two-states perspective and a two-states solution in the end. EU has not contributed much with a concrete proposal in the past, so we should constructively deal with the proposal from the United States. EU is contributing a lot in terms of development aid and other terms, but uh, has not proposed anything in the past. So let's deal constructively. If somebody reacts with violence to a solution proposal, this is not a reliable partner, and the reactions by violence were wrong in the past. Uh, dear Commissioner, take that into consideration to deal constructively with that and to be connected with the pro-Western values powers in this world. Thank you very much, colleague Mandel. Our next speaker is colleague Mixer. Mr. Speaker, it's hard to regard the most recent U.S. peace plan as credible since it does not meet the principal parameters for peace. It is not fair and even-handed. It does not follow the basic principles of international law, and its drafters only managed to engage one of the two parties to the conflict. Whatever domestic political ends in the U.S. or in Israel the plan's launch may have served, its chances of revitalizing the peace process are unfortunately virtually non-existent. Moreover, if Israel should, following the Palestinian rejection of the plan, restart settlement activity, or go on to annex parts of the occupied territories, it may entirely, be entirely counterproductive to a sustainable peace and eventually prove detrimental to the two-state solution altogether. The EU must stick to its, its principal position of holding firm to international law. We must continue to uphold the 
position that only a negotiated two-state solution can, in a sustainable manner, address the legitimate Israeli security concerns and deliver a Palestinian statehood. But in addition to having a clear and principled understanding of where we need to be at the end of the process, the EU also needs a credible plan of its own as to how to get there from where we are today. This is ever more critical as the US appears to be abandoning its role as an even-handed broker. Thank you very much, Mr. Mixer. Colleague Getta is our next speaker. He's so wrong. Mr. Trump is so wrong with this peace plan. It is peace, Mr. President, and it's not just a question of uh, force lines. And uh, this has to be based on equity if there's going to be uh, a future of art of of entente rather than conflict. There will be no long-term peace under these conditions. It is equity, it is fairness, and this is not what it is being proposed. So we will not uh, ag agree to that. We will not follow you. We will say to our Palestinian and Israeli friends that Jerusalem must be the shared capital of two equal people in their dignity for security and well-being. Blind people will say that's not possible because it is facts on the ground that count, but realism dictates it. How are we going to have a utopia of justice if it always ends uh, 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 with the triumph of justice? Thank you. Thank you very much, colleague Geta. For one minute, colleague Madison. Mr. Chair, uh, first of all, uh, I think it's a very important debate because uh, in the last two weeks there has been most of the topics uh, in the international media about a peace plan by the U.S. to the Middle East. First of all, I think it's very important for the European Union to understand international law because in international law we have to understand that it has to be respected from the both sides, from the Israel and also from the Palestine. And from the Palestinian side, we have to recognize that they haven't really understand the meaning of the international law that you can't support the terrorist organizations against the Israel. You can't support the way how you're using your children, how you're using like, as like the bombing attacks against the neighbor countries. So in this case, I think the Palestina is really breaking the international law what we have to also recognize. And the second thing is that it has been many critics against the U.S. about this peace plan, but I've never heard about any other solution or like any other plans to the Middle East. So I really want to... Thank you very much, colleague Madison. For one minute now, Madam Oaken. Thank you to Mr. Burrell for that clear statement about the illegal occupation by Israel of Palestine. It is the duty and the right to say that uh, whatever Hungary may think, if uh, the occupation continues, we'd not only see a violation of the UN resolutions but our own laws. And I'd like to know what is meant by annex will not be unchallenged. Hopefully the EU will step in with action and not just words. In 2016, the UN Security Council uh, adopted Resolution 2334, which talked about differentiation, a separation, therefore, between Israel and the settlement. So we should, therefore, make a differentiation uh, in uh, our policy, making it a principle to stop uh, settlements with regard to trade and culture, etc. And our high representative is mandated not only to condemn the Israeli uh, undertakings, threatening the life of Palestinians, but also to demand compensation. Israel has destroyed for millions of people, uh, the, uh, and the money must go back to the EU citizens. And thank you for your efforts hither up to this point. Thank you very much, Madam Alken. Uh, there will be no great blue cards here or additional questions. We now come to colleague Rausen for one minute, please. Thank you, well, Voorzitter. Thank you, President. You can have all sorts of opinions about the peace plan and uh, level all sorts of criticisms at it, but please, let's not do that today because that will not help the peace process a single step forward. The added value of the plan is that at least there is now something on the table. 
And so let's give it a decent chance. I only have one appeal to the Palestinian Authority. Stop protecting terrorists, recognize the state of Israel, and come to the negotiating table. Start talking. I emphatically dissociate myself from the High Representative statement. In your statement on the 4th of April, all you do is criticize Israel and the United States. And thereby, you're basically saying to Abbas, I can perfectly well understand that you don't want to negotiate. I wouldn't do it myself. President, I think that's the wrong message at the wrong time. You quite improperly represented this statement as being a statement of the European Union. If there's no unanimity on an issue in the Council, you cannot talk about the EU having a position on this. Thank you, President. Thank you very much, colleague Rausen. For one minute now... Uh, Mr. Kizil Yurek. Mr. President, the so called deal of the century is a plain violation of international law. It was prepared without consulting the other party concerned, the Palestinians, and it tends to legitimize the illegal Israeli settlements, which is a crime of war. It rolls back from the agreements of 1967 and denies Palestinians Jerusalem as their capital. I regret to say that Trump's plan is not only an assault on Palestinian rights, but also an attempt to put forward a new regional order that completely undermines international law. It is a deal which can harm the whole region and is not less unacceptable and not less dangerous than the colonialist CSPCO agreement from 1916. In an era of chaotic international relations, the EU must stand firm and continue to support the two-state solution, which is an independent Palestinian state in the borders of 1967. Furthermore, the EU should make a stand against the Israeli settlements, which violate the relative UN resolutions and show support to the right of Palestinian refugees to return to their homes. Thank you very much, Mr. Kusel Jurek. For one minute, Madam Injir. Mr. President, I refuse to call Trump's proposal a peace plan, as some people might do, because all this proposal is is a plan for how Trump will get himself re-elected in November in the USA and how he will get his friend Netanyahu re-elected in Israel. The plan violates international law, gives the green light to annexation of East Jerusalem and other parts of Palestinian territory and, gives the and breaks up the possibility for a two-state solution in which the two democratic states, Israel and Palestine, exist side by side in peace and security. In a time in which the USA has denied respect for international law, it is now down to the EU to show that we don't only talk about our fundamental values, but we fight for them wherever in the world injustice arises. The Palestinian people and the Israeli people deserve their respective states. The time is right for all EU states to recognize a Palestine according to the 1967 borders. That is what my Swedish government did in 2014, and I am proud of that. My question to the High Representative is therefore this. What will the Commission do to ensure that international law is upheld? Thank you very much, Madam Injir. For one minute, colleague Vest. President, uh, President. Thank you very much, President. Now, when I went to grammar school uh, in East Germany, in the former DD, uh, GDR, uh, then under Soviet uh, rule, and then uh, Pomeran and Silesia were under Polish control. And uh, that's why uh, those particular areas uh, would come would uh, come back would be returned after that after the uh, period. But now, 35 years have uh, have passed be between the uh, since the uh, Gaza and West Banks have been lost. When a creek, uh, when a war begins, then one must find some sort of solution thereafter. But uh, what we have right now, the resolutions of the UN, are the biggest lies uh, that have been uh, issued on this particular issue. And the same thing applies to what has been done by the European Union, uh, creating uh, nothing more than. Uh, a protracted situation without any movement, no, any development whatsoever. So we're living in a kind of lie now, the lie of the EU resolution and the UN resolution as well. Thank you very much, Mr. Fist. Uh, 
Colleague Satori is now the next speaker. The Trump administration's Middle East plan is a dangerous backward step and a denial of international law. It's not an agreement. Rather, it validates Israel's fait accompli policy, a unilateral uh, approach to the conflict, which you quite rightly condemned, Mr. Borrell. Given the serious nature of the events, we must welcome what you said, because the member states are incapable of reaching a unanimous position. We can't uh, enforce human resolutions with the resources we have available. Well, first of all, we need to uh, stop Israel de dis destroying structures which have received European aid. Let's work on our policy of the differentiation between Israel's internationally acknowledged borders and occupied territory. Let's bring an, an end to institutionalized discrimination. And lastly, above all, as the Palestinians have asked us to do, let's get an international peace conference reconvened for the Middle East. Thank you very much, Mr. Satori. Now for a minute, Mrs. Fayon. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Trump's so-called Middle East peace plan is a slap in the face. And uh, it's a slap in the face to international law, and it's against uh, looking for a solution to one of the most pressing issues in the Middle East. There will be no peace stemming out of this. And uh, this is just uh, another step on the way to implementing a complete apartheid regime. Israel has already put it in place against the Palestinians. The Palestinians are uh, not going to get their sovereign Palestinian state. Trump clearly doesn't realize that there will be no peace in the Middle East, Israel included, before the Israeli-Palestine conflict is settled. Therefore, I support you in your efforts to support international law and uh, in speaking against the annexation of the West Bank. We should immediately ban the imports of all products from illegal settlements. The Israeli access to EU programs should be conditioned with advancements in the peace process. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Fayon. Ms. Huttasari, now for one minute. President, 1967 Israeli borders is not realistic anymore because the circumstances in the region have completely changed in the past 50 years. Americans have promised to invest $50 billion in the Palestinian state if Trump Israeli Palestine peace plan is implemented. Israel will also commit not to build any new settlements for the next four years. At the same time, this treaty will safeguard the security of the state of Israel. EU should support this plan. This could be the last chance to achieve lasting peace after many decades of violence. It is time to put an end to, the, to this prolonged and hard conflict. EU should not object this deal because EU hates Trump. Thank you very much, Ms. Hutasari. For one minute now, Mr. Utasun. Thank you, President. Trump's plan is a violation of the international consensus on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's based on a unilateral approach, annexation, unequal rights, contempt for international law, and an ongoing occupation and conflict. As my colleague has said, this is a dictate, not a peace plan. I welcome the, uh, the boldly worded a statement by the High Representative, and it, the time has come to reassert basic international laws in relation to this process. We need a negotiated two-state solution with respect for international law and equal rights. In pursuit of that, I believe that the Member States must keep the hope of the two-state uh, 
solution alive and must seriously address the issue of recognizing uh, Palestine as a state to make that possible. And may I lastly add to the Vice President that the differentiation between the 1967 borders and legal annexations by Israel be maintained by the European Union. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Tassoun. Now for one minute, Mr. Benny Fay. Now, uh, uh, we uh, condemn uh, the proposal uh, made by Trump uh, as in order to resolve the Palestinian-Israeli uh, issue. And uh, Mr. Netanyahu has tried uh, over months to achieve that necessary majority, although he's embroiled in corruption and numerous different cases are open against him. Um, now the plan is totally unacceptable without consulting the Palestinians, without c consulting uh, the others on the issues of Jerusalem and the East Bank as well. There are numerous different violations of international law which are encapsulated within this particular plan. So I think uh, the High Representative uh, uh, has been very, very correct in calling for a two-state solution on the sixth basis of the 67 borders. and. Uh, Otherwise, the consequences will be very serious indeed. Um, I think Europe has to play a very important role here. It's absolutely necessary for us to not remain silent before any sort of violation of international law. Thank you very much, Mr. Benefe. Mr. Piccolo is next. Thank you. No peace plan can succeed without the support of all our conflicting parties. The way uh, this plan is published shows the weaknesses of the two leaders presenting it. It is uh, the, the expression of unilateral policy of the current Trump uh, administration. Let's remember the Paris Agreement, relationship to Kurds, the role uh, in Syria and the agreement with Iran. Certain elements as uh, presented as big concessions have already been agreed upon during previous uh, talks. What is particularly worrying are parts of the plan um, um, are, parts, are, are those related to the Jordan Valley and part of the West Bank. All uh, stakeholders need to uh, refrain from unilateral moves and uh, invest efforts in order to find a long-lasting uh, solution. Uh, and the solution uh, is a two-state solution which uh, would allow a peaceful coexistence of uh, two uh, peoples on both sides of the border based on international law. Thank you very much, Mr. Pizzola. Catch the eye procedure next. Sver. Thank you very much. Thank you for the floor. I welcome Trump's uh, Middle East peace plan because it's well balanced. Palestinians get something, peace. Uh, Palestinians get their country and Israelis get peace and security. The countries that did not support the plan rejected it together with Palestinians because Palestinians obviously like this status quo. Iran rejected the plan as well and my question for Mr. Borrell is you were in Iran recently and my question is did you discuss this plan with the authorities and secondly did you talk to them about the human rights violations in their country? And thirdly, why were you even there? Since this only helps to leg legitimize the regime that um, is against human rights. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sver. I've got three times too many requests for Catch the Eye as I have time for, so I'm going to have to cut some of them. Mr. Ruiz de Vesa. Thank you very much, President. And I'd like to thank the High Representative as well, Mr. Borrell. I uh, support the particular statement that was made by Mr. Borrell. I think it's very important from a procedural point of view as well in order to overcome uh, 
the various uh, quagmires that uh, the uh, that we've fallen into as concerns security in both entities and also the proposal for peace of Mr. Trump. It's already been said by you and many others as well. The majority of the speakers as, uh, involves a number of different problems and is not implementable. Uh, but some colleagues have forgotten that there is an alternative, a European alternative, and a proposal, a very detailed proposal like that was presented by Mr. Trump. Perhaps it's not that, but an initiative, uh, uh, a European initiative for a new conference of peace in the Middle East as took place in Madrid in 1991 might be a good idea and it we ought to begin to work in order to m create the necessary conditions to be able to implement a new European proposal for peace. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ruiz de Vesa. Mr. Stefan Utze is the next speaker. Domnule înalt reprezentant Borel, în ultimele decenii de negocieri pentru pace în regiune, întreaga comunitate internațională. Thank you. During recent decades of negotiations, the whole international community stressed how important it is to have a plan based on the principles of international law. Any peace plan is welcome, provided those principles are respected, as long as it's inclusive and presupposes the existence of two states for two peoples it, coexisting in peace and security. In the absence of a plan of that nature, the status quo will remain. We cannot now rush to do something that we failed to do over so many years. Ms. Vertmans, this, this multilateral um, peace conference under the UN auspices is precisely what we need. Thank you. Vielen Dank, Herr Kollege. Thank you very much, Mr. Stefan. Uh, Mrs. Kemper is the next. Speaker. Mikro. Bardzo dziękuję, Panie Przewodniczący. Szanowni Państwo, przysłuchiwałam się dzisiaj. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Ladies and gentlemen, I've listened carefully in today's debate. And on the one hand, we've had the supporters of this peace plan, but on the other hand, the critics. There hasn't been an awful lot said that's been very tangible. And the dramatic situation on the ground just continues. Anybody in Jerusalem will know quite how dramatic the situation is. And there's a new generation of people growing up, which is another lost generation. And I think that's true to be said. The young people are preparing themselves to fight rather than for peaceful coexistence. High Representative, you said that there have been a number of talks with partners in the USA. I'd like to know with whom you have had these talks and what the, con the conclusions of those talks were. What we need is a constructive plan. It is extremely urgent. And any of the proposals that are being made may take us a step further forward so that we can finally get peace in the region. Mr. President, uh, thank you very much. Mr. Mudig is the next speaker. Arvoisa herra puhemies, YK on todennut moneen kertaan. Now, the United Nations have on a number of occasions stated quite clearly that uh, settlements on occupied uh, territories is totally illegal. That's why th this particular plan of the United States is something which is a serious violation of uh, international law. And it cannot guarantee, if it doesn't guarantee anything for the Palestinians, it's not possible to implement. We need a two-state solution if we want to have peace in that particular area. Uh, Palestinians have to have their own uh, state and they must be able to have that right uh, of self-determination as well. This is a one-sided proposal, that of Trump. It gives uh, the Israelis the fertile land uh, all the best and uh, gives the desert to Palestinians. Uh, and this proposal is the worst possible proposal that could possibly be made in order to propose peace in the area. I hope that the High Representative will work intensely and in a concerted fashion in order to, for us to have a true freedom proposal that will be implementable. Thank you very much, Ms. Motik. And finally, in the catch the eye, Mr. Nicolao Alavanos. <laughs> We condemn the totally unacceptable proposal of the United States, uh, which has 
It simply creates a protracted situation as far as Israeli occupation. It foresees giving over uh, uh, Jerusalem to the Israelis and maintaining the settlements, the illegal settlements. The uh, governments of the European Union, uh, including the Greek government, have maintained a kind of equal distance between both parties, between the sacrificers and the sacrificed. They have upgraded uh, relations with uh, the Israeli government, with new military agreements. So I think it's very important for us to emphasize the necessity of supporting the uh, Palestinian people. If the view of Madame Asima Kopulu is also the view of the Greek government, it is extremely dangerous indeed. These are totally unacceptable views. And let us not forget that uh, members, that parliaments in different member states have actually recognized the uh, Palestinian state, and it is absolutely necessary for us to push forward for a two-state solution on the basis of the 67 borders, with capital being East Jerusalem. Alavanos. Thank you very much, Mr. Nicolau Alavanos. That concludes the Catch the Eye procedure, and the High Representative for the European Union, Commissioner Borrell Fontelles, will now conclude the debate. Thank you, President. You? Uh, we know this is a very decisive, divisive issue, no? It is in the Council, it is in the Parliament. But uh, I would like to remind you that I am not expressing my personal opinions. My job is to be the high representative of the Council. And I had to represent what I think is the opinion of the Council. Mr. Sverg, I haven't said, no, no, I haven't said that this statement was a position of the European Union. I precisely said, and you should have listened to me, that since it was not unanimity, I said, and it isn't a record, since it's not unanimity, I could not present an agreement of the Council. It was a statement of the High Representative. Representing whom? Representing the 25 member states who agreed with the statement. I said very clearly, you didn't notice, I repeat it. It was not a statement of the European Union. It was a statement of the High Representative because it was not unanimity. Uh, why, Mr. Zerb, why are you going to Iran? Because I have a mandate, an unanimous mandate of the member states of the Council asking me to go and to talk with everyone in the broader region of the far Middle East to try to look if there is any possibility for us, European Union, to contribute to increase the stability and the peace in the region. I have a mandate. I go to talk with everybody. Everybody means everybody. And I've been talking with the Foreign Affairs Minister of Saudi Arabia. I went to Jordan. I, I've been talking with the Emirates. I went to Tehran. I will go to Iraq in order to have a look at what can we, us Europeans, do in order to contribute, if we can, to the peace and stability in this region. Sorry, I, 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 I met a confusion, Mr. Swer. It was not you who said about uh, it was an statement or was not an statement of the European Union. I think it was Mr. Uh, our colleague Rizem Berjan. Sorry, I made a mistake. So my answer was directed to the, the member Rizem Berjan. My answer to you was related, what did you do in Iran, no? And for sure we talked with Iranians about, about everything that worries them and what worries us. But the main purpose was to say, what can we do in order to save the nuclear deal and what we can do in order to stabilize the region? We didn't spend much time talking about the Israeli 
Palestine, Palestine issue, because the Iranians are very much aware that they, had, they have nothing to say on that, on that problem. Another member, I think it was Ms. Kempa, with whom have you been talking in USA? Well, with the most prominent people, with the Secretary of State Pompeo, with the, the Security Advisor, Mr. O'Brien, with Mr. Kushner, the author of the plan, and with uh, Ms. Nancy Pelosi. And for sure, the three first were very much supporting their plan. Uh, Ms. Nancy Pelosi, who, as you know, is a Democrat, was very much critical about it. As I am saying, I am not expressing my opinion. In fact, my opinion has no interest here. I'm expressing the majority of the Council. And the majority of the Council has supported a statement by which we sent a message saying that, first, everybody has to refrain from any unilateral actions contrary to international law, and that could exacerbate tensions further. We are really asking not to declare the annexion of Jordan Valley. And this may happen. And if this happens, you can be sure that it's not going to be peaceful. Maybe someone doesn't matter. But for us, it matters a lot. Because we cannot raise a wave of violence, another wave of violence in Palestine. We're asking Palestinians to keep calm and no go to violent demonstrations. We asked the proposal to be considered as a starting point. And I said clearly that maybe it could break the stalemate and create a dynamics in which we can go and talk again about what can we do in order to look for a solution on this very old and damaging and painful problem. I am not denying the possibility of this being a starting point. What I am denying is the not the possibility, the fact that it's being considered as an end point. Because if, if I tell you, come and negotiate, but I tell you one thing, if we don't agree, I will implement any way my proposal. Well, this is not a big incentive to negotiate. Come and negotiate, but be aware. If you don't agree with me, I will anyway implement the proposal. Do you call that a negotiation? That's what we refuse. And that we've been saying. And believe me, we invited Secretary of State Pompeo to come to the Foreign Affairs Council to explain directly to all member states their proposal. I know there are some who are closer to this position and others who are very far away from this position. I know that this is not going to be a unanimous position on that is two devices. But we have to discuss. And we have to look for, a, if not unanimity, the, the, the majority, whatever it is. I believe me, I don't think the majority of the member states of the European Union are considering this proposal as a good starting point. But we'll do our best, talking with, every, with everyone, in order to try to break this stalemate and to push for negotiations. Some very optimistic people said, told me, why don't we try to do something like we did many years ago in Madrid, Oslo process and Madrid process. I think we have the commitment to do something. We cannot just refuse. We cannot say that's not good enough. We have to look for something that works. And this is going to be part of the discussion we are going to have next Monday on the Foreign Affairs Council. Thank you. Vielen Dank, Herr Kommissar Borrell von Telles. Die Aussprache ist ab. Thank you very much, Mr. Borrell. With that, we conclude this debate.